when I'm walking down the street. I do want to say to Donnie and many of you in this room that over a very long career in this city, all of you have helped me and my colleagues tell the truth and to try to tell. What does this event mean to you, Miss Peggy Mars? Oh, my heart. Happy 20th anniversary. My heart is about loving up on my sister. Do you know what it feels like to have your sisters in the room? Done. Just what you see in the flesh. I'm free from people, free from myself. There's a the doctor lives next door to the janitor, the janitor to the, to the reverend, and the lawyer. We were together. Now we get so high and mighty that you create stress for your society because you don't like poor black folks in That's a health problem. Get yourself together so I can stop being taking care of geriatric people. <laughs> First name's Donnie, last name's Glover, in it to win it for the long haul, baby! All right, all right, all right. So, yesterday we got a chance to hang out with the vice president over at the White House. It was a, a wonderful occasion. I got a chance for the first time in my life to see Atala Shabazz in person. That is Malcolm X's daughter, and I tell you, it's like standing you know, watching royalty. So I'm kind of floating on a cloud. Also, there was the vice president, Kamala Harris. And she said something that really touched this black journal. She acknowledged the black press. And I tell you, there I, I don't know that there could be a greater honor. Uh, her mentor, or one of her mentors, Mr. Willie Brown, spoke so highly of the black press during uh, a convention for the National Newspaper Publishers out in Portland, Oregon. I guess this is about 10 years ago. And if you know anything about Willie Brown, former speaker of uh, the House for California, he's a dynamic, uh, well-dressed, articulate, and visionary leader that we are fortunate to have in Black America and in, and, and in America at large. But beyond that, he is such a brilliant person. And so to have, uh, in my lifetime, heard our first woman and black woman, vice president, and to hear Willie Brown speak so highly of the black press, it really warms our soul. Our job in the black press is, is, is often challenging but nonetheless doable, and we thank God for it. And we'll get into that more later. These are my two books. This one is the latest. I always get mixed up. Now, this one is the latest, 2021, I Am Black Wall Street, available on Amazon and Barnes and & Noble, and so is Unapologetically Black. Charles Robinson, one of my mentors, says that I do a horrible job at promoting myself, very good at promoting other people, but uh, such is life. Joining us today to discuss reparations is the daughter of a very dear friend of mine. I guess I've watched her grow up a little bit, Tanera Cullens. Good morning. How are you, ma'am? Good morning to you. I'm doing well. And today's topic, or at least we'll start with, is uh, reparations. You are in a reparations documentary. Is that correct? I am. Um, it's called Pay Up, Get Out the Way. I'm very excited about it. It's been showing since the end of last year, and we've got a couple more shows coming up. So I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing more people out there. 
Why is reparations important to you? So reparations is important to me for several different reasons. One is I'm an African-American female living in the United States of America, and I can stop there. Um, but, you know, there are so many things, I believe, that are owed to Black Americans um, that live stateside um, because of the things that we've endured and the things that we still endure because of the Jim Crow era and because of slavery and many other things in between, redlining and so many other things, especially in Baltimore City, um, that I think people people are definitely owed reparations. Now, reparations doesn't necessarily mean money all the time, um, although that would be great. <laughs> but you know, just being able to breathe clean air, have access to green space, clean water, many things that we've seen in recent years, people don't have access to. Um, that has been strategically done to communities of color. And so I believe we do need reparations for that. The Japanese got money. The Native Americans got money. Other people get money. We want money. <laughs> yes. Money and it's a it's a it's a both and not an either or for sure. Change is so difficult to now. A lot of people, including black people, we want to stay stuck. I think they call it cognitive dissonance. Mm -hmm. That even though we see the light, we're blinded by the ignorance of the past. Absolutely. Black and white. I mean, you got some black people today. I've seen it. I've seen it recently. Who act like they don't know slavery is over. Or who act like all blacks endured slavery. Or who act like white people didn't go through slavery. We don't know what we don't know. And, and I tell you, I think part of the reparation should be an educational curriculum nationwide that illuminates the things that have been hidden, like Black Wall Street. Who knew that there were 500 black towns in East Texas alone? Who knew? Absolutely. I, you know, there's so many things going on right now where people are trying to erase history from schools, right? People are coming up against teachers and curriculum that has been taught for many, many generations. And um, I, I agree with you, education for, for sure in schools, but I would also say um, changing our media too. So it's great that we have um, our Black folks that promote um, the great things about us, but so many times people see the negative stuff, right? They see um, the movies and they listen to the music and they pick out the negative stuff to say about us. And it's promoted very heavily, but a lot of the positive things that we're doing are not not promoted. So, you know, I feel like <laughs> there's definitely a, um, a hand in, in that that the media plays for sure. Um, and not just in the US, but around the world, the things that folks say about black people is because of things that are put in the media strategically to make us look like we're inferior. You know, one of the things that I have to say to you is that we have to have the courage to speak truth to power. Even if it offends some people who want to hold on to some of the stuff of the past. Sure. So now yesterday I was at the White House and we were there for what they call Descendants Day. And Descendants Day featured Malcolm X's daughter, uh, Ken Morris, he's the, her name is Atala Shabazz. Uh, Ken Morris, he is a direct descendant of both Frederick Douglass and uh, Booker T. Washington. While we were there, 
as we're about to leave. I was speaking with a young black woman journalist. And she said to me, they only want us to come to certain events. She had to be half my age. I'm 58, maybe she was 30. Mm -hmm. Last summer, there was an event at the White House it featured the 50th anniversary of hip hop. I did not go for that very reason. Don't invite me for hip hop. I can cut on my iPhone. I can cut on the tele. I can cut on Alexa. When I come there, I want to talk about Ukraine, the Red Sea. At the same time, now this is a young lady, she's saying to me, they only want us to come here for certain things. At the same time, I got to tell you this. I hadn't been to the White House at all through the Trump years. Mm -hmm. At all. So let me pose the question to you. Given a choice, do you not go at all? Or do you go knowing that you got to look at it like this? So that's that's a tricky question. Yeah, um, it is. <laughs> I think, <laughs> I think um, you still go. One, because um, you have truth in you. And sometimes when people are living a lie or spreading lies and they're in the room with truth, it, it causes them to be a little bit more truthful about um, their stance on a lot of things. Um, and you might be able to illuminate some stuff that other people might not be able to. If, if Trump's only in the room with yes men and people who only want to push his agenda and not with people who will push back and argue points, then that's a disservice to the American people, right? So, you know. He, he's a total disservice to the American people. Absolutely. And so yeah. he denied the black press altogether from, from my perch. Mm -hmm. I didn't see any access. So is a half-baked measure better than no measure at all? Absolutely not. But, you A half-baked measure is worse? <laughs> you know, sometimes sometimes you have to you have to play the game a little bit to get in. And then, you know, you might still be able to get your word in. I, I don't know. I, I'm I'm going to go that way. And let me tell you why, because. And those are my words, half big measure. And I'm not sure the best way to verbalize that. I can only call them like I see them. Mm -hmm. But what I will say is. Yesterday, I saw Kevin White, I saw Erica Lowe, I saw Roderica Applewaite. Kevin White was the first one to give me access to the White House back in 2010. So to see him 14 years later, I can tell you I've seen more and more black people and black, let me tell you, black women all up in this White House. I've I've seen it everywhere. I'd rather have that than no access at all. Sure. But no, I'm not I'm not coming to the hip hop concert. <laughs> because I want to talk about Ukraine, I want to talk about the Red Sea, I want to talk about the the Houthis, I want to talk about Hezbollah, I want to talk about uh ISIS and and everything else globally international. My intellect goes a step beyond just hip hop. Absolutely. It has its place, but don't call me for the hip hop concert. I not definitely saying, so. not saying I wouldn't enjoy it, but that's not my purpose. My purpose is to talk about our history, our facts, today's world, the current events. So let's go. How did you get involved in the documentary on rep reparations? So, you know, I'm I'm a Baltimore native, I'm a Baltimore girl, and I always wind up meeting somebody somewhere who's asking me to do something. And um, in this particular instance, my father um, told me there was this young man, John, who was working on um, this film, 
And I met with him, we talked about it. And sure enough, I had the time and I gave, I gave my spiel. I talked about, you know, some of my experiences um, growing up in Baltimore, living here as an adult, things that I've seen, you know, and how it also affects the environment because I am an environmental scientist. And um, there's so much, you know, that's being done that has been done to communities of color in the United States that affect us from an environmental standpoint that I feel like gets ignored um, unless there's a serious crisis like, you know, millions of people getting poisoned by lead in their pipes, right? Or something to in that regard. So um, that's kind of how I got involved, kind of by happenstance. I just went to visit my dad and then here I was. In this you got dragged into it. Big ups to Marshall Collins. He's been a big brother to me for many years, as long as I've been a journalist, uh, which is about 30 years. Um, you mentioned Johns Hopkins. You know, they don't have the best reputation in Baltimore either. Sure. You know, I, I went to Hopkins for grad school um, and it was a great education. I can't lie to that. Um, but, you know, I do acknowledge and recognize the things that they've done in the past. There are so many institutions um, and connecting institutions. Um, even Sam, outside Harvard, of it. Brown. Yes. The list goes and on. Historically. And, and, and these so-called Ivy League. Been, yes. That historically have done things that are unimaginable to black and brown people. Um, so... Yes, absolutely. J. Marion Sims, they call him the father of gynecology, and he actually practiced on black women, practiced medical procedures without anesthesia. Yes. And they call this son of a bitch the father of gynecology. Yeah. Shame on you people. Mm -hmm. Shame on you savages. Yeah. A lot of those practices are still happening today. The tools have not changed. They're just as cold, just as scary. <laughs> if you go into a doctor's office today as a woman, it's still just as scary, to be honest with you. I think of the North Carolina sterilizations that went down. It's in the book Medical Apartheid. Mm -hmm. I think of when my daughter's mother, my then wife, uh, went to University of Maryland to deliver our daughter. And she said she felt like the nurses, the, the healthcare staff treated her as if she were a second class citizen. Mm -hmm. There have been several studies done that she a lot of like medical, treated her like a welfare mother. A lot of medical students still have a belief that black skin is tougher and diff more different than white skin. So people still hold these. What asshole taught them that? What yeah. asshole taught them that? They still think these things. So, you know, it's Did stuff that mothers teach him this? I mean, we, who who comes up with this is stuff that is unimaginable to a lot of black people. Yeah. What asshole taught him this? I mean, I, this, this shit makes me mad. And you should be. And that's why so many people are fighting for us to have better health care, better access, and for more people that look like us to be in those rooms and those spaces. So let me say this. If nothing else, I do commend the Black people at the White House for pushing the agenda. Because the only other way, I imagine, is like a January 6th insurrection. In which case, if Black people were climbing the walls of the Capitol, we already know how these racists get down. They'd have been shot. Yeah. But this country actually finds a way to defend this rat bastard Donald Trump and the insurrectionists, many of whom have been sentenced, and five people got killed. Yeah. Five people died as a result of this foolishness. But this rat bastard could actually be president again. Mm -hmm. Because that's, some that's people feel as though his rights are being violated. Mm -hmm. This is, we have some sickos in this country. We do. Money and privilege affords you a whole lot in this country, unfortunately. Um, and 
that's something we're just going to see over and over again. There's things that we can't do that other people can. And, and I don't know if that's ever going to change. If I see one more damn Taylor Swift tweet, I think I'll just jump in the damn harbor myself. <laughs> they keep lifting this ugly white girl up as if, my God, who the hell is she? I never heard of her before this damn Super Bowl. Just shoving it down our throat. Who, who was it who said that? What, one of our famous people said it. They just keep shoving, shoving her down our throats. Why? Taylor Swift has a big following. And the NFL wants that money. So you're going to see the, Taylor but, Swift. But, but let's, let's be honest. The NFL is not much different than the slave auctions when they put our players up on these blocks, similar to an auction blocks. They're, they're opening their mouths and checking their physique. Modern day I, slavery. Might yes. as well play, we shall overcome. If you go into the schools, though, and you hear what people say to our young black men, they think that's their only ticket, that or basketball. And unfortunately, they they buy into it. It's not true because so many of them, if you listen to them, are educated. They have so much more to offer. But physicality and brutishness is what's being pushed. And so that's what they want. Tanera. I know your daddy. I know your mama. I'm going to ask you as a black woman, what is up with all of these black women half naked or naked on social media? What in the hell has happened to us? And what's happening with these? I mean, I'm seeing more feminine guys today than ever before. I'm not knocking anybody's lifestyle, but what happened to black masculinity? Two, two bold questions. Hmm. I can't speak on black masculinity. Um, Can I you think, imagine your daddy in some skinny jeans? I cannot imagine my father in skinny jeans, but <laughs> my father was born in 1951. So, you know, I think our ideas of masculinity and femininity shift over the years. And I'm not going to jump into that particular topic. However, the nakedness of women, um, I can attribute to years <laughs> of media consumption thinking that's okay. So I would say that so many people um, in my age group in particular um, grew up listening to songs that really only idolized our bodies, right? You want to see my behind, you want to see my boobs, <laughs> you want to know what I can do with my mouth or my hands. Those things were in our songs and they were prevalent, right, growing up. And that is something that I know every dance I went to in middle school and high school, those songs were blaring, right? And music is something that doesn't leave you, right? You remember the lyrics to a song, you could be humming something and be like, what is that? Where did that come from? Because you've internalized that over time. And so I feel like a lot of people don't feel like it's wrong to show their bodies, right? They want to, they feel like it's just self-expression or it's self-love in some kind of way, even though it is degrading to a point. Um, so, some you know, of these I people in there are 50 and 60 years old. So the 50 and 60 year old people, they're jumping on the bandwagon. That, that's, insecurity um and it's like they're trying to compete with young women 20 years old yeah social social media is like a drug so if i can get views if i can get clicks <laughs> if i can get likes that's what gets me you took off all your clothes and you get six likes <laughs> self was it worth it you gotta ask that no i will not no i will <laughs> not <laughs> yeah but, you know, I, I, I can only speak to how I was raised and how I grew up. So I know that for me, it is not empowering to be naked. It is not empowering to show my body to the world. I was brought up, you know, in a very strict <laughs> Christian household. So, you know, I have different viewpoints from others, but I, I don't think that um, it's empowering, but other people do. And I can't tell you what to believe about yourself. You got to see the light on your own. 
So what are we going to do about this reparations documentary? What What is it that we want people to gain? So first, we want people to come to the conversation, right? So we've got um, three more scheduled showings. And after each of the screenings, we have a conversation. And people actually get the opportunity to say, this is what I would like to see. This is what I want moving forward. This is what reparations means to me. Because in the film and even in those discussions from several of the um, screenings I've been to, people have very different viewpoints about what we need to do, what we need to enact. Um, and so, you know, February 17th at Liberty Village, 11 a.m. to 2.30, um, there's another screening happening. And I'm hoping that people will come out and, sh and share their ideas. Um, where's, where, where's Liberty Village? Liberty Village is at 3901 Main Avenue. That's in Gwen Oak. Oh. Um, yeah. So, you know, we want people to come out. We want people to share. We want people to share the film. So that is accessible to people. When they come, they'll have access to that. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we have an Eventbrite. People can look up, pay up, get out of the way, and sign up so they can come if they're not free on the 17th, we've got a showing on the 21st and the 27th. So there's lots of things um, that people can do to get involved. And, um, you know, the last discussion did go down the education route. More people want to see a curriculum um, in Baltimore City Public Schools, Baltimore County Public Schools, and beyond that also um, nationally. People want to see, you know, change in the criminal justice system, not having to check a box to say that, you know, I was a felon, right? What does is, what is that matter to my job if I'm trying to work at Walmart or Target, right? Um, people want to see, like myself, um, more stringent laws on where you can put incinerators, for example, and things that will increase asthma and respiratory issues in our communities of color or people who are impoverished. So we all came together with these different ideas about what we, we like to see. And um, we've got to work on the steps in between of how we can make these things happen, but we've got ideas. You know, yesterday, uh... Over the past couple of days, I've just had some very interesting conversations where people were saying vote. The, the topic came up, vote, vote, vote. Um, we, we've gotten our people to vote. We do vote. But we live in a nine to one Democratic city, a two to one Democratic state. And I'm telling you, Tanera, that I've seen Republicans do more in the vicinity of Freddie Gray on North Avenue. And I'm talking about from Walbrook, Lumber Mill, next door to Coppin down to the 2100 block of West North Avenue, the Imad Center uh, run by Rashid Aziz, full of young adults. They make clothes, they make frozen sorbet. Where are you with voting? Where are you with Democrats? Where are you with the Democratic Party? So I am one of those people that doesn't vote party. I, I vote according to what you say you're going to do, what you say you're going to enact. Um, so if your views align with mine and what I think should be happening in the city, I'm going to vote for you. I don't care if you're a Republican, a Democrat, blue, green, yellow, whatever. I'm, I'm going to make sure that you get into office, at least on, on my behalf. I'm going to vote for you. Um, I do think that people need to read <laughs> people's statements and also look at their past behaviors because you can write anything on your website when you're running for office, but if your track record shows the opposite, you know, it doesn't work. So people have to do their research. They have to really jump in and it can't be the day of me just reading blurbs on the internet. You really have to like do some research um, to say who you're gonna vote for. Um, and that's that's just a, a, a good practice, I think. Who should be running for office? I mean, I'd like to run you for mayor. <laughs> I would not like to run for mayor. <laughs> um, I am involved in many other ways um, in the city of Baltimore and beyond, but um, we, we, we I, could I, use a conscientious black woman like yourself who loves her mama and her daddy. I'm pretty sure you love the good Lord above and you would do a wonderful job because we, we, we don't have the best selection of candidates. I appreciate that. Um, what I would say, though, if you do have 
questions for candidates. Um, there are a lot of different forums happening um, and, and coming up soon, I'm helping to organize um, an environmental forum where um, 11 of the 13 uh, mayoral candidates will be present. And so you will be able to ask your questions of them. Um, that's happening on February the 28th. Um, where? So that is at Mount Lebanon Baptist Church. That's across from Parks and People. Oh, up there um, with uh, Lance. Yes, yes, Dr. Frank Lance, absolutely. Um, I don't have that um, address off the top of my head, but it's it's right it's right next to um, uh, Mondawmin Mall, so you oh, can't. Oh yeah, can't really miss right, that. right there with the speed camera. Yes, yes. Yeah, we so, know we we know Franklin, and so then you you may be able to come and help us in March as we have one here in Sandtown. Maybe we can add in an environmental component. What what kind of environmental questions will you be asking? I mean hypothetically lead water sure so people are asking all kinds of questions people are asking questions about um tree canopy so we've lost a lot of trees because um they're knocking them down to build developments and other things and that's affecting our air quality a lot there's a lot of asthma and respiratory issues in baltimore city and we're constantly taking down trees for things that many people think are not necessary so there's tree, tree canopy questions. There's questions about the quality of our water and um, policies about polluters, because we do have people that come here and illegally dump all the time in our water. Um, we also have things like the- um, there, there are people, let me just add in, there are people who come to Sandtown illegally dumping, and if we catch them, I swear to beans, we will chase them down to the ends of the earth. We Because it's not people in Sandtown. It, they paint yeah. all of these pictures by saying that I've seen them and I've seen people come through and just throw stuff out their window. And it's like, how, where is your mother? Yes. Just yes. nasty. I'm yeah. sorry. It, 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 it annoys me. Trash can. New York City can be clean. New York City. I see people in New York City put trash in a trash can. Downtown Manhattan. But we live around some nasty people and you can't blame that on no white man. Yeah. So trash and recycling will also be up for um, discussion during this meeting. Um, I street, street cleaning. I, I recycle. All kinds of stuff. So, you know, it's a it's a broad swath of things that are going to be discussed. And people do have the opportunity to write their own questions when they come in the door so that the moderators can read them and they'll be answered also. So, you know, there'll be a lot of input. There'll be young people there. They'll get a chance to ask their questions. Um, and I, I invite people from all demographics, all ages, wherever you live in the city to come, because we do need more people to ask questions of these folks before they go into office. Mm. Why can't we get you to run for office? <laughs> that, that's not my ministry. Uh, that's not my ministry. So this is a ministry for you? Where does the good Lord come into play? Yes, absolutely. So my my being an environmental scientist, I believe, is a ministry. Yes, I'm in the ministry of care and protection and conservation. And if I were in office, there's a lot of red tape you got to jump through to get anything done. If I'm boots on the ground, I know I can get something done. Well, I'm going to pose a really stellar, out of this world question to you. Okay. Now, you're an environmentalist. Matter of mm -hmm. fact, I saw you got a master's of science and environmental what? Science and policy. Should we be digging up the moon? I saw the Russians and the Chinese up there bringing back samples from the moon. Damn it, we got eight planets in this solar system, right? Eight. Why are they digging up the moon? <laughs> They, you're laughing at me, but I want to put it on the record. Donnie Glover is asking, why are these fools digging up the moon? Okay, I, I, I digress. So, unfortunately, the planet we currently live on is not being treated with any care. So they going to treat this one. So they abuse this one, and then we trust them with that one? People want to know where else we can go. So if... if Stop dirtying up this one. If you go to other country, <laughs> build another country on a planet or or the moon, people want to know if there's they water. Dirty. They still dirty. 
That's that's the thought behind it. So you don't remember. You might be too young to remember this. There was a commercial. Little boy started having sex, and his mother said to him, "Pretty much, don't bring no babies in here." But she also said, "You can't even keep your room clean. We can't keep the earth clean. So now we want to be in dirty." I mean, okay. There's no hope for humanity. <laughs> I, I I hear you. Um, I do think that we need to change our behavior across the board. Um, but if people don't care, what can you do? I don't know. But I know they don't need to be digging up the moon. <laughs> what about the harbor? Can we clean up the harbor? Can we clean up the oceans? I mean, we throw everything. Oh, I, I, I see little, you know, sea animals and they caught up in plastic bags or you know birds that are you know covered with oil from an oil spill we have no idea what how we get you know what happens to the oil that we get to to warm our homes to, to fuel our cars. we have no idea what happens when an oil spill covers uh, a great percentage of the ocean uh please on the environment so so absolutely the harbor for sure um so i don't know if you know but um, you know, people people do the the polar bear plunge in the winter time, and we actually had hosted a polar bear plunge in the Inner Harbor because it is a lot cleaner than it used to be. Now you might not believe that, but I promise you it is. I do not, because it looks filthy. And you know, let me tell you this: Did I tell you I went to the Middle East, the 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 Red Sea? I I looked at the water; it was clear. It was clear. I submit to you, it was clear. And people have been living over there thousands and thousands of years. We've been in this country all of 200 years. And then turn that water, it looks like a filthy bathtub. It's just horrible. I'm sorry, I digress. Well, okay. the soils and the, um, the geology are different. So the water doesn't have to be clear to be clean. Um, that that's that's one thing. So you can have green water, you can have brown water, and it's still just as clean as any other water. We don't we don't live over there. They've got different geology and soils over there, but it's definitely it's 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 on the upward trend. And there's more work being done. Um, and the harbor now we've got um, the Middle Branch Revitalization Project that's happening that's connecting um, disconnected community members to the inner harbor, the outer harbor, you know, um, making that water cleaner, making it more accessible. People can eat out of people already eat out of it, but uh, making it better for people. So, you know, there's a lot now, of stuff. Now, happening. Now, let's, be, let's be honest, you know, to now, I, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to bust your chops, but. We have a high rate of cancer of it has to do with that damn water. Sure, and that's why we're working on it. I okay. promise you it's getting better. You can you can look you can look at um the stats and the water readings. I know the um the aquarium and Masonville Cove and lots of other folks are collecting water samples all the time and they're able to detect you know what's going on in the water at any given time we're getting better at our sewer overflows not happening so frequently so there's a lot of stuff that is happening it is getting better and i hope that you'll still be here to see it be even better <laughs> um well damn you, you know, just pushed me to the graveyard <laughs> Um, but you know, it, it's, it's, it's a whole lot better than it used to be. I, I can promise you that. And the, the fish and the crabs are telling us that the things that are actually coming in and able to survive, um, in these waters are, are telling us that it's getting better. Okay. So let's do, let's do a final plug for this reparations film. Who's the producer? Who's, who's, who shot the film? Oh gosh! Now you're now you're gonna make me look like a big no, no, person. No, the guy. His name's John John Comer. Oh yes, 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 yes. Tell he, me about John Comer. Well, we're, he's yes. not even from Baltimore. How did he come here and pull together such a production? Oh, he's he's passionate. He's very passionate about um, about black people, about reparations, about. Um, positive things happening in our community, and he doesn't even want to be the centerpiece. He wants he wants it to be a community effort, and I think that's the nice thing about this project. Um, John is a really great guy, and.
he's pushing for us to share it with more and more people. And lots of people have been asking for the film from other states. So, you know, the word is spreading like wildfire. People are trying to implement it in their classrooms and talk about it. So, you know, February 17th, 11 a.m. to 2.30, Liberty Village. That's 3901 Main Avenue. Please come. And if you can't come to that one, go on Eventbrite and look up reparations documentary, pay up, get out of the way, um, and you can sign up for one of the other dates. We want to hear your voices. We want to know what you've got to say about reparations, what you've got to say about the city you live in. Is, is anybody against reparations? I'm sure there are, but we're not worried about those people. We are not worried about those people. There's always going to be somebody who's standing up against what's right and what's fair, especially in these United States of America. And I don't care about those people. I do not. So I, I got to ask you, have you come across Dr. Ray Winbush? Yes, I have. And, you know, he's been the, I would say, the father of reparations here in Maryland. A professor yeah. over at our beloved Morgan State University, um, have you had a chance to talk with him at all? Or Absolutely. So Morgan State um, was actually the last host for the last screening we had. And Dr. Winbush was actually the moderator for that discussion. So it was a it was a really great conversation. There were students there, different people from all over Baltimore that came out to talk. Um, and we also had a panel of folks um, who were asked pointed questions and got to respond also. So it was really it was really awesome. What is your generation's take on reparations? I would say that my generation is definitely <laughs> concerned with um, student loans, <laughs> um, housing if, costs. If you're Black and in America, you should be going to college for free. And, and uh, Georgetown, Harvard, uh, Hopkins. You know, Hopkins benefited off of Henrietta Lacks. They want to play I dumb. Agree. We know they made money off of Henrietta Lacks. I agree. I agree. And they, 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 and they can strike my loan right now. <laughs> yeah, full um, scholarships. Yes. Yes. So, but, but here's, here's the other thing in there. There's some of us who, who keep saying this thing not all black people meant to go to college. Yet, your ass get locked up and you're over there jailed, and then all of a sudden you're trying to get your GED. So I'm, I'm, I'm a little sick of hearing that thing. Now, I've seen these cats ride up the street one-handed, blindfolded, on a, doing a wheelie, on, and you telling me this cat can't sit in the classroom and learn something? We need to stop that foolishness. I said it. Everybody can go to damn college. Because if you are a carpenter, electrician, you still got to send out invoices. You still need to know how to work a computer. We, we limit ourselves so much. Now, that, you know... Yeah. If your daddy kicked you, if your mama kicked you limitations, you would not have gone to Johns Hopkins. And I know you went there because you figured it was the best around. And it is in, in many regards. I mean, yeah. they got enough money. Yeah. So I'm, I'm I mean, pro all that Henrietta Lacks money. If we had all that Henrietta Lacks money, we could yes. do that stuff too. <laughs> I'm pro HBCU. So undergrad, I went HBCU. Um, so I, I'm a Morgan grad. And I also went to Hampton um, my first year of college. But um, for graduate school, I definitely went to Hopkins because it was closer to home than any other place and had my degree program. So that was the reason for that. But um, yeah, I mean, people can go to college. That's their choice or trade school. Those are the two two options in my mind. But you do need some level of education to further yourself. Um, a lot of people just want to work three, four or five jobs, but it's exhausting. That's not a good quality of life. Um, and I would not want to do that. I want to work my eight hours, go home and enjoy this house that I bought with my own money and be able to, to live a good life. And that's what I'm, I'm pushing for everybody. Good stuff. Janelle, thank you for joining us. Any final thoughts? I, I just want to say, I hope that everybody out there who's listening, that you do take the opportunity to educate yourself about reparations, educate yourself about Black history, because it is still Black History Month, and share with other people your thoughts. I hope that you all have a, a wonderful day, a wonderful week, and that you allow God's blessings to be upon you, because we're, we're still alive. If you're still alive and you can hear my voice, that's a blessing. So...
Thank you know, you. we, we got to get the name of the documentary up. Let me put the name of the documentary up one more time. It's called Pay Up, uh, Get Out of the Way. Pay Up, Get Out of the Way. Talk yep. to you. Did you get paid for your role in it? I did. I did actually. Yes. He's very, for you. John is very good about making sure that people get paid for their labor. And let me put his name in there by John Comer. Yes. Because so often. No, when, you asked, the, when you asked for the producer earlier, I was like, who did the filming? But <laughs> yes. Well, apparently he and I had met long before this uh, came back around and uh, big ups to your dad. For making it known to us yeah. that you were a part of it. I mean, your dad is so proud of you. Oh my God, he's so proud of you. <laughs> yes, absolutely. I'm I'm always excited for the opportunity to talk to people and share my thoughts. So thank you for the opportunity. Good deal. Uh Tanera Collins, daughter of Marshall Collins, dear friend, big brother of mine, uh, straight out of Sandtown. Represent. We're proud of you. That's right. All right. Yeah. Take so care. Thank you, all. thank you all for joining us and good morning world.